In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. For this Chaplain's Report, I know I normally give some context or some background, but with this one, I don't think you really have to know a whole lot about it. This one just kind of speaks for itself. And so we're going to jump straight into the scripture in Matthew chapter 20, verses 29 through 34. As they were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. And two blind men sitting by the road, hearing that Jesus was passing by, cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. The crowd sternly told them to be quiet, but they cried out all the more, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. And Jesus stopped and called them and said, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Lord, we want our eyes to be opened, moved with compassion, Jesus touched their eyes, and immediately they regained their sight and followed him. This is a parable that is kind of overlooked, honestly, in the Gospels. We don't talk about it as much because it's not as dramatic and there's not as much detail given. It's kind of short. It's at the end of a chapter. And because of that, we don't talk about this one as much. We talk about Jesus healing the blind man with clay. We talk about him healing the blind man that had been blind from birth, and there was the whole thing about the Pharisees and healing on the Sabbath. Like We talk about those because there are more details, but this is actually a fantastic microcosm for the entire message of Christianity. And I think that it is somewhat criminal that we tend to overlook it. Because I was reading this story last night, and I kind of looked at it from a different angle than I ever had before, and I was like, wow, I... I really never thought about it from this point of view. You see, it's a perfect lesson for how people are supposed to react to Jesus and to the world. Because what happened here is when we have a problem, when we have a issue that we have to deal with, whether it's sin, whether it's personal, whether it's some kind of trial or struggle, what do we do? We cry out to Jesus. That ought to be the first inclination that a Christian has. You're sick, you're struggling with a particular kind of temptation, you're having problems with your family, you're having problems with your friends, you're having problems at work, cry out to Jesus. That's the reaction that you're supposed to have. Jesus is near, you cry out to him, please, Lord, have mercy on me. And then, when the crowd, and this inevitably happens, is going to tell you, Hey, quiet down, knock it off. And your reaction to this should be exactly like these two blind men. Cry out all the more. When the world tells you not to lean on Jesus, not to cry out to him, hey, shut up about all this God stuff, that is motivation to cry out to him even more than you were before. That's what it means to be somebody that relies on God. And then the third aspect of that is that when we are healed, when Jesus hears our plea over the cries of the world, and if we are sincere, he always does, when that healing takes place, we follow him. That we cry out, we have that solution, and then our immediate reaction is we follow him, we follow his word, we follow his commands, we follow the church. We're all headed in the same direction. We follow Jesus. And that's partly done out of gratitude because we were blind and now we see. And it's partly done because that's what we want to do. That's what we ought to do. And so I think that this is a great little, you know, a tiny little microcosm for everything that it means to be a Christian. Because here's the thing, the world is always going to tell us that this is not something we need to do. The world is always going to tell us to quiet down. The world is going to say, hey, you know, I get that you're going through stuff, but keep it to yourself. You don't have to bring God into all this. They'll also tell you things like, look, God isn't the solution. You're wasting your time. You're wasting your breath. 
that's the moment where we have to cry out all the more, just like these two men did. And I was thinking about it. Why is it that the crowd told him to be quiet? Now, we're not told really, but the large crowd, I'm sure that there were some people that didn't like Jesus that were just kind of there for the spectacle or there to watch the rest of the people in the crowd. But it says that there was a large crowd following him, which would suggest that even most of the people in this crowd were believers in Jesus or at the very least interested in him. And yet it's this crowd of people that have followed Christ and come to see him that are telling these blind men, hey, quiet down. Let's give them the benefit of the doubt and ask the question, why were they doing that? Maybe it wasn't evil intent. Maybe they were doing it because they're thinking, these guys are bothering the teacher. They're bothering the master. They're bothering Jesus. Maybe that was going through their mind. I don't know. Maybe they were thinking, hey, you're bothering us. We can't hear the lesson. We can't hear the sermon because you guys are shouting at Christ and wanting him to, to heal your blindness. So knock it off. I think there's a couple of really powerful lessons there. First of all, the lesson to us should be when you're when there's a person crying out for help, you don't try to quiet them. If there is a person that is crying for something, the first thing that we should do is we should say, hey, let, let me help you get Jesus' attention. Let me help bring you up to the front so you can talk to Jesus. See, that's what the crowd should have done if they were believers in Christ. And so I think it's really important that we not do that or we not think maybe the other way that, hey, these people are bothering us. We're trying to worship. We're trying to listen. Look, listening to a sermon taught by Jesus Christ himself is a very noble thing to want to be able to hear. But the priority should have been help my brother. Because it's a good thing to hear a sermon taught by Christ. It is a much better thing to live out a sermon taught by Christ. To actually do what Jesus was talking about and helping those in need. You can't get so lost in the forest that you can't find the trees. And that's, I think, what was going on here. I don't know that for sure. I can't see into the crowd's heart, but I think that's what was going on. I don't think the crowd was intentionally trying to shut them up just because they were being mean-spirited. I think they may have even had, at least some of the people in the crowd had good intentions. They were like, hey, he's bothering the crowd. People can't hear Jesus, and he's bothering the master. Jesus doesn't need to be bothered with these trifles. No, this is exactly what Jesus came to the world to do, to restore sight to the blind, to feed the hungry. That was his mission, and the crowd missed that. As his followers today, as the crowd that's supposed to be following Christ, let's never make that mistake. Let's never be so busy trying to sit around and talk about Jesus, talk about the Bible, talk about, you know, get into these theological discussions that we forget that, hey, our mission is to seek and save the lost. It's a wonderful thing to sit around with brothers and sisters and talk about the Bible, but ultimately we have to remember that the only reason that, that is a good thing is because we're supposed to then go out into the world and preach to others. This crowd lost sight of that. And what did that crowd learn about their faith? They learned that that was what their priority should be, and it's the same lesson that we need to learn today. Stay the course, friends. <laughs>